don't agree with John Brown and what he did. There was a legal course in America for him to follow. John Brown was a horse thief from Kansas. Uh, he stirred up trouble out there in the Kansas-Nebraska wars. And uh, all he did, and he wasn't in the majority. A majority of people maybe have the right to change the law, but a majority of 21 does not. I think in our democracy, in our republic, you have to give anybody credit that's going to stand up for the minority, because the majority rules. And people get stomped over all the time, and Brown was big enough to say that's wrong, and I want to do something about it. I, I think Brown struck a blow for freedom, and it was obvious that moral suasion had completely failed or was ignored, and his cause was righteous. Therefore, I feel he's, he was well justified in the raid. Yeah, I don't think that any cause justifies cold-blooded murder. John Brown was a hero. Brown was wrong, but he made this country think about uh, the morality of this institution called slavery. Slavery's wrong. I mean, we all know that. How can you do anything else but to pull a John Brown? How can you do anything else, <coughs> regrettably, realizing maybe that you're sinning or that you're doing something wrong? Four million people, human beings, not numbers, not dates, not facts and figures, not words, but human beings, they deserve to be free. Out of the old man. A slave was property. And no man in this society today has a right to go into my house to steal my television set, to break my windows. No man in the 19th century had a right to go and steal another person's property. That's exactly what Brown intended to do. What Brown stood for was wrong. He was morally wrong. He killed. What is important is he was a turning point in history. He's a moral force in, in our history. John Brown and his tiny band of raiders, 22 in all, took up arms against slavery here at Harpers Ferry in 1859. At that time in the slave states, we had four million people held in perpetual bondage by less than half a million slave owners with powerful political and legal protection. In 1859, neither John Brown nor anyone else knew how bitterly and at what cost in lives the slave system would be defended. It remained for the Civil War. It began a year and a half later to reveal that. John Brown came without any government authority to right what he believed to be wrong. But at that time, many Americans believed that slavery was not wrong. And this raises a question we have no clear answer for to this day. When is it right to take up arms against an established evil? When does terrorism become freedom fighting? We will find no answers here that satisfy everyone, but here, in Harpers Ferry, is the place to study the question. John Brown is one of the most controversial and emotionally charged figures in our history. His image still evokes deep passions, ranging from hatred of the old Devil Brown to religious devotion to the memory of St. John the Just. During his own lifetime, he was referred to at times as Osawatomie Brown for his violent and daring escapades in the bloody Kansas War. Old John Brown, the business failure and farmer who fathered 20 children. Captain John Brown, the abolitionist zealot who was determined to purge this land of slavery. John Brown, the lunatic, who had always been insane. And finally, at the very end, the martyr. John Brown, who gave his life so that others might live in freedom and dignity. Who was John Brown? And what made him come here, intending to free every black man, woman, and child in Virginia? The answers, if they can be found at all, do not rest merely with John Brown himself, or here in Harpers Ferry. As we look back to America in 1859, we see a nation on the brink of civil war. Attacks by northern abolitionists against white southerners in slavery were growing stronger by the day. The South fought back in the halls of Congress and on the plains of the Kansas Territory. They defended slavery and damned those Yankee abolitionists who wanted it destroyed. Among the many reasons for white southerners' defense of slavery, one they rarely admitted was fear. Fear that suddenly freed slaves would overpower their former masters and take revenge. Slave rebellions in the past had been put down, 
but not without cost. During Nat Turner's rebellion in 1831, 57 whites were killed. If we look at John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry and the nearby farms and plantations, we can see what it meant to white Southerners. John Brown arrived with a wagon load of pikes and rifles, intending to pass them out to liberated slaves, raising the horrifying specter of a slave uprising. The raid confirmed the South's belief that abolitionists were prepared to use violence in attacking the institution of slavery. Of course, there were other sources of bitterness between the North and the South, which finally led to war. But slavery was the issue that fired passions on both sides. And it was the issue that accounted for John Brown's raid. For John Brown, slavery was an evil that had to be stopped before it destroyed the minds and hearts and damned the souls of whites and blacks alike. Despite claims to the contrary, slavery was not dying out. Cotton was king, and white southerners were pressing for more land, more slave territory, more plantations. John Brown could not accept the romantic image of life on the plantation as Jefferson Davis described it. Under the mild and genial climate of the southern states, the African slaves have grown in number from 400,000 to 4 million. In moral and social condition, they have been elevated into docile, intelligent, and civilized agricultural laborers. They are supplied with bodily comforts and careful religious instruction. Under the supervision of a superior race, they have helped make this land prosper. As a young man growing up in Ohio, John Brown had seen how black people were often badly clothed, poorly fed, whether slaves or freedmen. By the time he was 18, John Brown had personally led one slave to freedom and defiantly declared in public that all runaways who came knocking at his door would be welcome. As he matured into manhood, Brown became a radical abolitionist. He lived in North Elba, a black community in upstate New York. He ate with his neighbors, white and black, socialized with them in their homes and his, and considered them his equals in every way. Most white people of the time, abolitionists included, believed that black people were inferior. In fact, many white northerners advocated abolition only as a means of getting blacks out of the country entirely. John Brown genuinely believed that all men were created equal. Like many of his anti-slavery brethren, Brown was a deeply religious man, but he did not belong to an established church or congregation. He believed himself an instrument of the Almighty and was perfectly secure in his own moral rightness. Brown was a very religious man. He read the Bible on a daily basis. He read it hours per day. Brown felt, in his interpretation of the Bible, that God was saying, slavery is wrong. He is, he is serving God to bring an end to slavery. Maybe he is right if he's answering the law of God. During the 1850s, it was simply the Old Testament, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, and that final statement that he made about the fact that it would take a lot of blood before this country was purged is almost goes hand in hand with this idea of an eye and a, for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. The man had no other thought in his mind as to a way of curing this country's woes except by blood. Neither did he belong to any of the established white abolition societies. He regarded their emphasis on peaceful persuasion as hopeless. 
He said, talk is a national institution, but it does not help the slave. And in this respect, he urged the use of violence more than the general anti-slavery movement. After the passage of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, Brown organized meetings of runaways who feared for their own safety. He counseled them, trust in God and keep your powder dry. In 1855, Brown went to Kansas with money and guns given to him by secret supporters in the East. This was the time of bleeding Kansas, the frontier territory where pro-slavery and anti-slavery settlers fought their own civil war six years before the rest of the nation. As the country expanded westward, the slavery issue went with it. Which new states would be free? Which would be slave? It was here that John Brown's moral commitment solidified into violent action. Newspaper dispatches spread his reputation quickly. In the Southern press, he was portrayed as a ruthless killer for the execution-style murders of five pro-slavers. On the other side, the abolitionist press cheered him for the stand he later took at Blackjack Creek, where he and his men fought off a large contingent of pro-slavers bent on murder and revenge. Kansas made John Brown a hero for many and a wanted man by the law. John Brown's dream was to attack slavery at its very heart. His Kansas activities were a trial run preparing him for what he considered his true destiny, the Blue Ridge Mountains. This was to be the staging area for a grand scheme to raid southern plantations and free slaves. Harper's Ferry was to be the first step in this plan. He would use the mountains as strongholds, bases he could use in raiding surrounding farms and plantations, freeing slaves, some of whom would join his army, and others sent to freedom in the north. According to the plan, Brown would continue his raids farther and farther into the south, wreaking havoc on the entire plantation system. Each liberated plantation would swell the ranks of his provisional army. Once the raid was underway, however, his military tactics proved far weaker than his moral convictions. In the chill and gloomy darkness of the late night hours of October 16, 1859, a band of raiders, white and black, stole into the sleeping town of Harpers Ferry, Virginia. They called themselves the Provisional Army of the United States and took their orders from their commander-in-chief, John Brown. Who's out there? What's all the fuss? Open the gate, man. Let us in. I came here from Kansas. This is a slave state. I want to free all the Negroes in Virginia. And if the citizens interfere with me, I must only burn the town and have blood. They overpowered the guard and took control of the United States Armory and Arsenal and the Hall Rifle Works about a half mile up the road. The raiders secured the two bridges into town, freed slaves from surrounding farms and plantations, took hostages, cut the telegraph line, and in just a few hours, found themselves fighting for their lives. At the first blow of morning, with the armory, arsenal, and engine house secured, Brown seemed on the verge of lightning quick success. Yet, with ample opportunity to leave, the old man mysteriously delayed. And soon the townspeople and local militia began firing in earnest at the raiders, killing ten, including two of Brown's sons. Sporadic firing and fighting continued throughout the day and into the next night. Brown and his remaining men surrounded and trapped in the engine house. Then, on orders from President Buchanan, Lieutenant Colonel Robert E. Lee and the detachment of United States Marines arrived from Washington. Lieutenant Jeb Stewart approached the engine house. We are prepared to relinquish the hostages 
if you will grant safe passage for me and my men away from this place. Colonel Lee is not prepared to alter the terms in any way. Then Jeb Stewart gave the prearranged signal for the attack. One quick wave of his hat. remain. Why did Brown wait so long? Why didn't he flee to the mountains as he had planned? Hours before his escape routes were closed off, his second in command, John Henry Kagey, was urgently exhorting Brown to leave the town. But he stayed. Was he simply surprised by the speed with which his opponents gathered? Or did he, as he stated, have so much concern for his hostages but it kept him from doing what he knew he should. John Brown wanted as little bloodshed as possible. But four townspeople, ten raiders, three liberated slaves, and one Marine were killed. John Brown had a very strange proclivity to kill the wrong people. The people he killed here in Harper's Ferry, the first person to die is a black man, who happens to be one of the, the free black men in Harper's Ferry. You know, I'll never defend slavery. I think one thing has to be said for the mindset of the period. Even intelligent people raised in the South felt that uh, you know, slavery was justified because they'd always lived that way and their parents and their grandparents had. I've heard it said, if 50 million say a ridiculous thing is true, it still is a ridiculous thing. Brown and the surviving raiders were tried here at the Jefferson County Courthouse in Charlestown. From the beginning, the trial aroused intense and nationwide interest. And Brown quickly realized that he could use the front page of the nation's newspapers and the witness stand to succeed in his mission even though the raid had failed. He was weak from his wounds and attended most of the trial on a cot. But he spoke so eloquently for his cause that one commentator observed it was slavery on trial, not John Brown. His defense lawyers tried for an insanity plea, but he would have none of it. Nor would Virginia Governor Henry A. Wise. They are mistaken who take him for a madman. He is cool, collected, and indomitable. He inspired me with great trust in his integrity as a man of truth and intelligence. Others beside Governor Wise were moved by Brown's integrity and sense of commitment. <clears throat> now, Mr. Brown, are you saying that it is acceptable for anyone to take the law into his own hands and force his own views down other people's throats, whether they believe as he does or not? I believe that to interfere, as I have done, in the behalf of God's despised poor, is not wrong, but right. Now, if it is deemed necessary that I should mingle my blood further with the blood of my children and the blood of millions in this slave country whose rights are disregarded by wicked, cruel, and unjust enactments, I say, let it be done. Southern whites discussed the trial with great excitement. They saw the raid as proof that slaves were contented and loyal to their masters. After all, they did not join this crazy abolitionist, did they? But taking no chances with this supposed loyalty, many whites in the South reacted strongly. Sign of trouble spread. Control on all blacks were tightened and slave patrols increased throughout the South. Support for secession from the Union grew. Former President John Tyler wrote, Virginia is arming to the teeth. More than 50,000 stands of arms already distributed, and the demand for more daily increasing. As his trial progressed, Brown found the word mightier than the sword. Northern support for him and his ideas grew. 
people such as lawyer reformer Wendell Phillips and New England intellectuals such as Thoreau, Emerson, Longfellow and Louisa May Alcott spoke out on his behalf. Virginia is a pirate ship. John Brown sails the sea as Lord High Admiral of the Almighty. John Brown has twice as much right to hang Governor Wise as Governor Wise has to hang him. Brown is a new saint awaiting his martyrdom, who, if he shall suffer, will make the gallows glorious like the cross. But in the court where the law of Virginia ruled, a jury weighed the legality of the raid on Harper's Ferry. John Brown, you have been found guilty of murder, conspiracy, and treason. And I hereby sentence you on December 2nd, in the year of our Lord, 1859, to be taken from your cell to a public place, and that you be hanged until you are dead. And may God have mercy on your soul. In his final weeks, he was relaxed and self-possessed, as if he had waited his entire life for this end. Newspaper reporters kept John Brown's name and his cause constantly before the public. He wrote scores of letters, many of which were published in the press. He declared himself resolute and content to die for his ideals. Even a visit from his wife did not destroy this composure. I am awaiting the hour of my public murder with great composure of mind and cheerfulness feeling the strong assurance that in no other way possible could I be used to so much advantage. To seal my testimony for God and humanity with my blood will do vastly more toward advancing the cause I have earnestly endeavored to promote than all I have done in my life before. John Brown died like martyrs are supposed to. Straight, fearless, and unflinching. I, John Brown, am now quite certain that the crimes of this guilty land will never be purged away but with blood. I had, as I now think, vainly flattered myself that without very much bloodshed, it might be done. It is not accurate to suggest that John Brown's raid was the direct and specific cause of the Civil War. It is, however, proper to note that the evocative image of John Brown's body became the standard under which thousands upon thousands of men and boys marched off to do battle in their own land. John 